Salam alaikum. It's a nice to be here in uh, Misr. Misr is one of the popular names also in Azerbaijan, the country where I come originally from. Can you imagine? The na you, you named your children, you, you, it's a boy name, uh, with the name Egypt, Misr. So uh, we have a lot of connections. Uh, in Azerbaijan, we also say, uh, in our language, we say Sabahun Khair. Pretty much the same. The question is, uh, you took it from us or we take it from you? I'm, I'm kidding. Of course, we take it from you. So <clears throat> what we saw today is that uh, from the presentation by, by Dr. Mona, uh, about the ancient Egypt and uh, we can definitely say that Egypt is a cradle of the civilization and many things uh, uh, in fact uh, you know came from Egypt from the civilization not only medicine many things I've just visited uh, Luxor uh, and uh, that was a fantastic trip it was just uh, walking in the big museum your country is amazing uh, but, you know, with all this, you have also obligations, you know, as Egyptian people. And your obligation is that uh, to do more, because there is always uh, room for improvement, to do more for our patients. And one of my uh, favorite topics is about the diagnosis and management of migraine, but today I'm going to walk you through the 10 steps, very simple one. And the reason for that is the following. If we take Egyptian you know, the population of Egypt, it's about 110 million, something like that, right? So it's about, if we take a lifetime prevalence of migraine, so 17 million people in Egypt, you know, they can be diagnosed with migraine. So can you imagine? If we take a women population, and women are very important, correct, Dr. Amar? It's a, it's a, it's a in Islamic culture, very important. And you have about 50, 52 million women in Egypt. I checked that. It's a correct number. A lot of women. So, and uh, just imagine that 25% of them, we're going up to the 13 million women, have a lifetime prevalence of migraine. And we know that Dr. Mona showed us with the global uh, report, the global health report from published in Lancet, years lived with disability, so just imagine so the age group of the Egyptian women from 18 to 50 years old, the most productive years of their lives, they are suffering from migraine. It's the number one cause of disability in this group of patients. So this is a huge number, and that's why I'm calling you now uh, that it is important that we have to do more for, for this patients. Of course, we care for all kinds of neurological patients, but the good thing about migraine is quite rewarding because it's not only diagnosed, but also we can provide the treatment. Now I can see here a lot of young people, and the question is now for, for you, how many of you are residents in neurology? Okay, so there are a number of residents. How many of you are neurologists? Okay, more neurologists here. And uh, during the medical school, during the medical school, do you remember the medical school? Yes. During the medical school, how many hours you had a topic about headache or migraine, slash migraine? And be honest now, Dr. Mona, few hours, right? In Denmark, you know, we are very proud about our system. We had about, um, I would say, three, between three hours, three and a half hours, something like that, on average about headache in neurology. So it's a very few hours. And when we talk to our physicians in Denmark and we consider ourselves a very important, you know, in the headache field, we did a lot for education, you know, to talk to the general practitioners, to neurologists, we still have a lot of problems by prescribing a very simple medications for our patients, you know, such as the beta blockers. Beta blockers are available in Egypt, correct? And they're not expensive. Triptans. Triptans are available in Egypt. We have some generic triptans now. The sumatriptan is very cheap in Denmark. Still, 
we have a problem by prescribing that. So that's why we need to do more for education, and, and Professor Tassarelli also mentioned about the education as one of the important pillars in, in neurology and uh, in headache particular. So we're going to talk about the migraine and the 10 steps. Why 10 steps? It's not my idea. The idea derived, in fact, from one of my young uh, junior uh, colleagues. They came to me and said, Masood, when you read and do something about the headache, you also need to read other literature, not only headache. So they were inspired, inspired by other specialities uh, for the diagnosis of different diseases in 10 steps. The 10 steps intuitively very easy, right? You do the 10 steps and that's it. So I hope that this paper that I'm going to present you, it's a free available. So you can also spread among your colleagues and encourage them to read that and uh, to help us to diagnose more people with migraine. So here are my disclosures. And this is a consensus paper and the paper which is a background for my presentation today. So the idea, as I told you, derived from my juniors and they came to me and said, let's do something about that. We discussed that at the Danish Headache Society meeting and we decided uh, that uh, we need to do something. So we approached a European uh, Headache uh, Federation because we are part of the Society of the Federation and also European Academy of Neurology. And uh, we discussed to develop a 10-step approach to the diagnosis and management of migraine. So each step was established by uh, expert consensus. Uh, this is very important. And which was supported by the review of the, the most current uh, literature. And uh, when we have uh, the consensus statement uh, together, we developed uh, these 10 steps. And with the step one, we suggested when to suspect migraine. This is something GPs, general practitioners, and the junior neurologists ask me, what is the easiest way to suspect migraine? Well, as a all in neurology, we know that the key for the diagnosis is a history. And history is not given, history is taken. So you have to take the history from your patients. So this is, a, I would say, 80 to 90% of the success in neurology in general. Any kind of recurrent headache, moderate to severe intensity, raises suspicion about the migraine. And this is what the 90% of migraine patients presents. And you don't have to be super, you know, clever, smart, Einstein, you know, to diagnose the migraine. It's quite easy. There is also a very interesting subtype of migraine, which is associated with the symptoms preceding headache. We call them aura symptoms. And Dr. Mona showed that the different phases, including the aura phase. It's only one third of the patients experience the aura. But neurologists are, you know, fascinating by, by the aura. And the reason that because we are neurologists, we're crazy about focal science. We like focal science, right? Everything should be a neurological deficit. So in this case, you have a transient neurological deficit, self-limiting. It's not a permanent, and it's different from all other, let's say, neurological focal sciences. So 30% of people with migraine, they experience visual aura, which is uh, the most common type of aura. The gradual evolving symptoms over the time and over the space. We call them aura. Another important point in the diagnosis of family history. We always ask the patients and say, any family members suffering from headache? Don't say migraine because some of the patients might say they don't know about the migraine. Or some patients also get a little bit offended by the word migraine. At least in Denmark, they can say, well, I don't have a migraine because a migraine has also some kind of a stigma. It's not good. So that's why I ask that, what about anybody suffer from headache? Yes, not migraine, but headache, yes. And what happened? Yeah, my mother always complained the headache and she went to the room, closed the door and turned off the lights. Aha, uh -huh. now you start thinking about the family history of migraine. The onset of the symptoms. 50% of the people migraine, they report onset before 25 years of age. 
It's very, very important also. But it could be also a late onset of migraine, so be aware about that. In particular, in women, it can also start between age 30 and 40. But again, if you have all these symptoms that I mentioned before, and they're recurrent, they're stereotyped, they're the same, you think about the migraine. Now, this is migraine without aura, and the key in the diagnosis of aura, it's a international headache classification of headache disorders. We are so lucky in the headache field, we have the classification. Not many, uh, let's say, areas of medicine, they can, they can say, well, we have a clear-cut classification. What does it mean? It means that in Egypt, in Denmark, in Italy, we diagnose in the same way migraine patients. So it's very, very important. It's a key. It's a most of the cases, unilateral location. Even when it's a bilateral on the both sides of the head, but still there could be some preference. In my case, I'm also a migraine sufferer, by the way. So it always starts as a unilateral in my neck. It gradually evolves here and then becomes bilateral. Okay? Many people experience a pulsating quality. Pulsating quality. How you say pulsating in Egypt, uh, in Arabic? Nab. Nab. Okay, we say nabs. So, so it's the same word. So it is, it is a pulsating quality. And some people experience this when they start moving. Not when they're sitting quiet, but when they start moving, they feel it as a pulsating. Then migraine patients always want to be quiet, to go to the bed, stay in the bed, or just sit. Because every movement, you recognize that, right? Yeah. Every movement worsens your headache. It's very, very important. And there are also very important associated symptoms with migraine. So you need them to diagnose the migraine. And it's photophobia, increased sensitivity for light. We say hasas for the light. The same word, right? You took everything from us, Amr. Then you have uh, nausea. Then you have a vomiting in some cases, not must, not necessarily. And also increased sensitivity for sound, for loud. And this is important because some people, they say, no, I don't have it. And I ask the question, can you go to the concert? So can you imagine that you have a migraine attack and you go to the Egyptian concert? I mean, Egyptian concert is already very loud, right? The music. And can you imagine when you have a migraine? It's impossible. So this is very important to have a complete picture of the migraine attack. Then we move to the aura. I mentioned before that the most of the cases they experience aura, and the aura is the visual aura. But also we have patients experiencing the so-called sensory aura. And again, the focal signs, we neurologists will like focal signs, but they spread gradually over the time and over the space. Sometimes they reach the face, they reach uh, area, perilabial area here, and people feel that they have been just on the, you know, around the dentist, you know, having uh, anesthesia. Some of them are afraid, they think it's a stroke, but it's a different because it's a gradual development. And it usually lasts about five to 60 minutes. And in the visual case, you experience a fortification spectra. It's like a not the same like a Luxor temple, but maybe like when you watch the temple from the sky, you can see these fortifications, the same you see during the aura. And the symptoms are unilateral, and it's usually hemi, hemiform, and always, always it is must, it is a biocular, okay? It's a biocular. Some people say that, well, I have only on the right eye, then they should cover next time the left eye, uh, sorry, the right eye, and then they will experience the same symptoms also with the left eye. So they are biocular symptoms. This is for aura. I mentioned about the, the key in migraine diagnosis, a classification, because migraine, it is not something that we can take a blood test or do the imaging. Many patients coming to me, I'm sure the same in Egypt, they demand CAT scan, they demand MRI scan because they think that there must be something wrong in my head, right? So the most of the cases that I see, they already have scans and maybe twice, three times, you know, and they ask you to look at the scan 
you know, and see maybe something wrong in my brain. Nothing. So migraine is based on history, medical history, and applied diagnostic criteria. Of course, we differentiate because we have to be aware about the secondary causes, but in the most of the vast majority of the cases, fortunately, they are primary headaches and they are primary migraine. We need to examine patients. Neurological examination is a must. We also have to take a blood test, uh, sorry, blood pressure. This is very important because many junior doctors, they forget to take a blood pressure. It's very important. Not because the blood pressure, uh, you know, it's a reason for migraine, but if it's a blood pressure is increased for some different reasons, lifestyle, whatever, you need to control the blood pressure before you start the medications. Use neuroimaging only when it's necessary, okay, only. But otherwise, don't misuse the system because we already spend a lot of money for the health care, right? So we need to be conscious about the costs. Diagnostic headache diary, uh, Professor Tarsorelli mentioned that we use to diagnose and also to reevaluate whatever it is needed and information about the headache features that I mentioned before, the, such, so, uh, the accompanying symptoms and medic medication use, all can be registered in the, in the headache diaries. You can use it also to monitor the efficacy of the medication in the so-called calendars. This is differential diagnosis between the migraine without aura and the episodic tension type headache. The most important point is that here, it says here, 60% of the chronic tension type headache patients do not report accompanying symptoms such as nausea, photophobia, and phonophobia. This is very important. Another important point is no aggravation by routine physical activity. And the most of the cases with the tension type headache, they really not reach the neurologist. They, they mostly go to the primary care physicians in Denmark. So they manage there. So we see the vast majority of the patients we see they have suffered from migraine. But there is no doubt of existence of this headache because the population-based studies showed a quite high prevalence of, uh, of uh, tension type headache. And even re-evaluation of these cases in American studies showed that they do suffer from the tension type headache. So it's not a migraine. The patient education and centricity is very important. We need to provide uh, reassurance and agree on the realistic objectives because we are not to cure migraine, we are about to control migraine. It's very important. We need to identify predisposing and trigger factors. But don't make things complicated. Don't tell them that if something triggers your headache, just stop doing that, stop doing that. By itself, it can reduce the quality of life. Because you don't have any evidence. How reproducible are these triggers? If I expose you to this trigger, I'm not sure that you will develop the migraine attacks. So it's all on the recall bias. It's retrospective. So be careful with that. And you need also to be a very specific and uh, individualize the therapy according to symptoms and needs. This is for the acute treatment, uh, the insights. We know that people go to uh, pharmacy and the first drug they buy in pharmacy is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. That's why, for the obvious reason, they are the first choice medications. This is reality. In ideal world, we can give them triptans, but this is not an ideal world. Most of the people that go, and we have an evidence for the, for example, for the uh, for the aspirin, we have evidence for the diclofenac and ibuprofen, they can also be used. If they treat the three consecutive, at least three consecutive attacks, and they are not responding, they can change to the triptans. As I mentioned before, you have a generic triptan, you have a sumatriptan, which is very cheap now, and you can use these two others, risatriptan and triptan. And again, three consecutive attacks, no response, then you can switch to the newer drugs. We call them GPANs, Ubergipan and Rimagipan, or Ditans, only one Lasmiditan. So in Denmark, we only have Rimejipan, and uh, we expecting Lasmiditan will come, but we are not sure about Ubergipan. 
Do we have a GPANS in Egypt? Not yet. Okay. So those are very expensive medications, and that's why they cannot be considered as the first or the second choice, only if the patient's not responding to triptans or they have, uh, let's say, um, uh, problems with tolerability. This is proposed algorithm for the acute treatment. So you can start with the ibuprofen, you can move to the, to the sumatriptan, then rise the triptan. You can combine sometimes with uh, NSAIDs because there is evidence combination with naproxen. You can go to another triptans and maybe subcutaneous triptan. It's still expensive in Denmark. I don't know if it's available in Egypt. No, but it is a very efficacious. Okay, very efficacious. And you have to document the drug failure. You can use antimedics, but you use them not to enhance efficacy of your acute medications, just to control uh, the no nausea if the patients are experiencing that during the attacks. This is a preventive treatment. The first line you see in the ascension list also we have a beta blockers. Candasartan is available in, uh, in Egypt, yes. It is quite efficacious and well-tolerated uh, medication. You use that, right, Amar? Yes. And topiramate, we talked about that before, the topiramate. Problem with the topiramate, some cognitive side effects uh, for some patients. Second line medications, amitripsilin. Uh, I don't really agree with that, but that was a consensus, so we have to agree. So fluorazine, I don't use much fluorazine. It's a old drug, Sibelium, calcium channel blocker. Do you have it in Egypt? No. In Denmark, it's funny. We use that in the pediatrics settings. It's used for most children, but in Germany, in adults. Sodium valproate, almost uh, never. And then third line, onabotulinum toxin A for the chronic migraine only. And we have a monoclonal antibodies now against the calcitonin gene-related peptide or its receptor. We have the list here Erenobab, Fremenozobab, Galkenozobab, and Eptinozobab. All of them are available in Denmark now. Uh, Erenobab is an antibody against receptor. Others are antibodies against molecule, anti-ligand. And Eptinozobab is an IV formulation. Other three, subcutaneous, every month. Fremenozobab can also be administrated every three months. Eptinozobab, every three months, IV. Very expensive, but in Denmark we have a full reimbursement. I do hope that you will also get it in Egypt. Maybe you can start with the chronic migraine patients at the, from the beginning. This is proposed algorithm that I use with the candasartan, metoprolol, topiramate, and if it's a chronic, we can go to the onobotulinum toxin A, eranobab, fremenozobab, galkanozobab, eptinozobab, our monoclonal antibodies. If it's an episodic case, we can use amitriptyline at night or Remegipan, which is now approved in Denmark, 75 milligram taking orally every other day. We're not allowed to treat episodic migraine patients with monoclonal antibodies yet. And I think the same in Italy, right, Christina? A now you accept that? Okay, but in Denmark, they are not reimbursed. I mean, you can theoretically prescribed, but it will not be reimbursed. We hope to change that so episodic migraine patients can also get it. So this is uh, managing in the special population, very briefly in older adults, menstrual migraine, pregnant, breastfeeding women, children and adolescents. Here, you know, this is just few uh, things that you have to take it into account, including for the older adults, uh, such as uh, side effects, interaction with other medications. For pregnant uh, women, most of the cases, this is the best period in their lives in terms of uh, uh, migraine because they get less migraine during the pregnancy. But after partus, after partus uh, during the breastfeeding period, it might come back and be a problem. Uh, sumatriptan, this is the only generic one and also triptan that we use in Denmark during the pregnancy if necessary and also during the breastfeeding period. Menstrual migraine, it's a complicated case because it can last long and also repetitive attacks and that's why it also requires some special approach. 
Children, uh, the most of the children, they have a shorter attacks and the triptans can be used, sumatriptan can be used in children and in the rare cases and also used personally, but this is not uh, evidence-based, uh, um, candesartan, a very small doses for children I use. This is uh, step seven, follow up. What is important that you measure effectiveness of acute medication, effectiveness of preventive medications, adverse events, and adherence. The degree to which the patient's behavior corresponds with the agreed recommendations from the physician. Pain freedom, two hours, it's very important. And sustain pain freedom for 24 hours to evaluate effectiveness of acute medication. Effectiveness of preventive medications, at least 50% reduction in monthly migraine days or days when the migraine in terms of intensity is a moderate to severe. And for the chronic migraine, you can be less conservative. You say at least 30% reduction of either of these variables that you measure. You collect, of course, the incident severity and treatment related adverse events. And as I mentioned, also adherence. Headache calendar, it's a very useful instrument, you know, for the treatment evaluation and it is little time. In Denmark now we prescribe electronic, so they do it electronically in the system and when I click in my electronic files, immediately the three months uh, calendar appears on my screen, so I don't have to do it manually. I can do it directly from the patient's app electronic system where they do it in the smartphones. So it's very easy, it can be implemented. Managing complications for the chronic migraine, you know, you have to manage, you know, the headache day and migraine day, you have to distinguish that. Medication overuse, uh, Professor Tassorelli mentioned, this is very important, and education here to explain them, it's very important. One of the most effective methods to prevent medication overuse in Denmark, you know what was it? Now you can say education, no. You know what we did? We, we, we did a special, special educational program for not physicians. Physicians are hopeless. We did it for the pharmacy workers. We went to the pharmacies and we showed them, but we talked about medication overuse and we gave them some leaflets, you know. They used it. When the patient's coming to, to, to buy the drug, painkillers, they say, uh, are you taking for the headache? Yes. Be aware about that. The consequence the drop of the referral for the medication overuse in Denmark. So now we're struggling to find patients to get them in inpatient clinic because they're not there. And when the patients, new patients coming, and when I say medication over, they say, stop it, I know about that. Because they already talked about that in the pharmacy. So maybe you can do it in the small district of Cairo, Amr. You know, uh, the, you know, four or five pharmacies. You can ask them to do that and to see whether there will be drop uh, uh, in the uh, consuming of medication. In Brazil, it's impossible. I suggested that to my friends in Brazil. They told me the pharmacists are making money. They're not interested in that. I don't know, maybe the same in Egypt, right? Yeah. So this is also important, recognizing and managing the comorbidities, neck pain, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances. Be careful when we talk about anxiety and depression. They are not a cause of migraine. Either migraine patients develop some anxiety and depressive symptoms because of aggressive migraine, or they have a B diagnosis, depression and anxiety, and you have to handle that. And if you handle that, I can assure you, none of them will improve in migraine. They will still come back to you and complaining about the migraine. Sleep disturbances, also we can talk about that. You know, so for some patients you can give them tricyclic antidepressants to improve their sleep. But in my opinion, if you improve their migraine by giving them efficacious preventive medications, you can also improve all these symptoms. Neck pain is a part of migraine. More than 70% of the migraine patients experience neck pain typically uh, as Dr. Mona mentioned, before the attack starts, like in my case. 
And finally, long-term follow-up is very important. Referral from the specialist back to the primary care because we cannot accumulate patients in our clinics. We need to give them back to the primary care physician, but with a good comprehensive plan. It's very, very important. And they can be referred back to our, you know, the tertiary clinics if there is no substantial, you know, improvement in their case. This is very important and also responsible for the long-term management, maintaining stability and reacting to change. This is in the primary care physicians. It's a mandatory. So that's why I suggest to have special educational also courses for the primary care physicians. But I know it's difficult, it's, at least in Denmark, probably in Egypt the same. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward for discussion. Thank you.